Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the February 6, 2024, work session of the Town of Ossini. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. So some notes before we get started on our topic today. Um, the Barcliffe Peak Skill Parkway Engineering Scoping Study. Jesse, can you hear me? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. The moderniz modernization of the Barcliffe Peak Skill Parkway Engineering Scoping Study, 9A, is available online and comments may be sent to the project manager, Sandra Jobson, uh, at 845-431-5723 or at sandra.jobson at dot.ny.gov. The comment period is open until Friday, February 9th. Band applications for the 2024 Ossining River Gym are now available on the town's recreation and parks webpage. The application window is open and applications will be accepted until February 16th. Running through March 8th, you can see Black Presence, Profound Influence, an exhibit in honor of Black History Month at the Bethany Artist Community. Also at Bethany, there is a workshop titled Imagination Honoring History and Reclaiming Our Stories, Marginalized Voices Through American Cinema and History, which will be tomorrow night, February 7th at 7.30 p.m. Check out their website at bethanyarts.org for more information. Friday afternoon at the Austin and Public Library is celebrating National Pizza Day with Friday Foodie Fun. Let's make a pizza at 4 p.m. This is an event for teens. Saturday night, February 10th, there are two exciting events. First is a Marshall McDonald Trio at 7.30 at Westchester Collaborative Theater and Blind Tiger Improv will be performing at Hudson Valley Books for Humanity at 8 p.m. Sing Sing Kill Brewery is hosting a Super Bowl party Sunday beginning at 6 p.m. As always, the Austin and Public Library will host, be hosting many events, including Pokemon Club, Chess with Chavez, Mahjong, sewing workshops, book groups, and more. Please see their website at austininglibrary.org for more information. The Ossining Youth Bureau is beginning a program called Oh Yes, Ossining Youth Engaged in Success, a program that creates a safe environment that builds and strengthens skills and to enhance academics and social emotional learning. For more information, call 914-941-3189. If you need help with your winter utility bills, please go to the New York State Department of Public Services at www.dps forward slash ny dot gov forward slash winter. If you know of someone who needs food and shelter as we enter the cold days of the season, they should meet at the open door in Austin daily at 8 p.m. and look for the white van. Open door is located at 165 Main Street and more information is available by calling 914-645-1482. The Westchester County Job Fair will be held at the Westchester County Center in White Plains, February 8th and April 30th. And there are many other fun and interesting events being held locally. You can look at the uh, Supervisor's Weekly Update on the Supervisor's webpage to see all of them. Do my co-councils have any events? Okay. Seeing that, we are gonna go into our town board discussion regarding our rezoning application for 40 Croton Dam Road um, and public hearing comments. So with that, Valerie, you're going to start us off? Yes. So I'm going to start tonight off with just a little background on the project and where, where we are now in the process. And then I'm going to turn it over to Christy. Um, she's going to talk a little bit about some of the the legal issues, and and then we're going to turn it back over to the board to answer any questions that you have or any comments. 
Um, so let me just start by giving just a little bit of background on this project. Um, the project itself is located at 40 Crogan Dam Road. It's approximately, I'm going to say rounding up to 18 acres uh, parcel. It was owned by, or it is still owned by the Stony Lodge Hospital. And this was a former child and adolescent psychiatric center, which closed in 2012. Um, redevelopment proposals started uh, in 2014. The original project included 188 multifamily project with all units being clustered in one um, single building. Um, the original uh, project also requested a rezoning uh, to a new floating zone, which was going to be called a multifamily to floating zone. In the this particular project, we started through the seeker process. It went through an environmental impact statement or draft environmental impact statement and got to the final environmental impact statement process at which time there were additional discussions with the town board and uh, additional comments from the community. And this project was put on, or the continuing the seeker review of the project was put on hold, was put on hold in 2019. Um, some of the concerns that were expressed during this original project review um, was, the school children that this project was gonna generate. Um, it also included community character of having this multi larger multifamily building within the neighborhood area. Um, traffic, um, it was concerned about affordable housing, trying to include affordable housing into the overall project. The number of units that this project proposed um, there was also concern about the massing of the building itself in terms of the how wide and how, um, how tall the building was. And then also the new zone that was being proposed because this zone was like a floating zone that could be applied anywhere within the town of 10 acres or more. So the applicant uh, looked at the, uh, with the proposed project and came back with the revised project. And the revised project is the project that's in front of this board now. And this project uh, was redesigned and now consists of 96 units, which is 55 and older age restricted townhome condominium uh, community. And it's also being proposed to use an existing zoning in the, uh, in the town and being rezoned to multifamily, which is the MF zone. So can I just chime yeah, in for one second? Um, as part of the modifications to the proposed project, I, I think believe there was some um, confusion with the public about what happened during the secret process. So basically what the applicant had to do was go back. They were at the final environmental impact statement stage. They had to go back to the draft environmental impact statement stage and do what's called a supplemental. So if there was information related to the property, related to alternatives and whatnot, that wasn't going to change regardless of what was being proposed, that remained the same. But then the supplemental draft environmental impact statement then subsequently additionally addressed those issues related to this specific proposal as Valerie described it as being amended, once that happened, then it went to the final and the supplemental final environmental impact stage where all comments received were addressed and then the finding statement by the planning board. So basically, once the project was modified, it didn't start from scratch, but they had to take a step back to supplement whatever they had already done that had changed based upon the changing of the application. Right. Sorry yeah. about that. No, no, absolutely. And so as part of that environmental review, I have, uh, I think everybody has a packet that I put on your, um, in front of you. And one of the things that I just kind of want to walk this board through. So at the very, the front page, um, and so they're all black and white, but at the front page and it has, it's from JMC, it's, um, that's the, um, it, that's what's stamped on the side. It's, this is the proposed layout um, that is being proposed currently. And so this is what you see here is the 55 and older townhome concept. If you turn to the next page, um, I wanna talk a little bit, touch upon the zoning um, the current project site, as you can see, it borders between the town and the village of Austining. Um, so as you can see, the town of Austining zoning um, has the R15, which is 15,000 square foot zoning as the minimum per lot, 
And there's R7, which also borders the project site, which is 7,500 square foot lots. Then the villages uh, within the village of Ossining, the zoning, the surrounding neighborhoods are S50, which are 5,000 square foot lots per um, dwelling. So one of the things that I just wanted to point out is that um, this particular project site is not necessarily uh, within a particular neighborhood per se, but it is a standalone parcel along Croton Dam Road surrounded by a few different uh, zoning districts all varying in um, minimal lot area between 15,000 square feet down to 5,000 square feet per lot. So the next thing I wanted to just, uh, if you can turn to the next page, so one of the things that had to take that has to take place in any sort of environmental review process is what we call a comparison of alternatives. And so this is a, an initial table, and I'm going to get, walk you through the alternatives because I actually have the layouts, which I think will help guide this discussion. Is the is the as the first alternative is the actual proposed project, which was the 95 age restricted townhomes with 10 affordable unit uh, 10 affordable units. Um, the alternative A, which is, and so when you look at alternatives in an environmental process, you look at, you look at other possible either development plans, other possible um, like tweaks to the actual development, and you're also required to look at what if you don't do anything to that particular project. And so some of the uh, alternatives that were identified in the planning board as lead agency identified these alternatives to include, and some of them actually came from the original uh, draft environmental impact statement. Um, so first was alternative A, which was the former project, because the planning board wanted to understand how the new proposed project related to the former project and how it helped uh, potentially the uh, alleviate some of the concerns and of the public expressed in terms of the environmental impacts. Alternative B is a conventional layout using the existing zoning, which was the R, which is R15, which is the 15,000 square foot lots. R, the alternative C was the cluster redevelopment, also again, using the R15 layout zoning. But when we talk about clustering, it means that you could have some lots that are slightly smaller um, and some lots that are slightly larger, just as long and to try to pr um, preserve certain um, environmental features. And then alternative D was a conventional layout with an R5 layout associated with it. Now, this would be essentially rezoning that property to R5, which is the village of Ossining's um, zoning districts. But the planning board wanted to get a sense of how many units could potentially be developed if it were um, similar to the surrounding um, zoning districts. And then alternative E was the no action alternative. So just a couple of things I wanted to point out in terms of one of the concerns that has been expressed throughout this project has been in terms of uh, school children. So if you flip to the next, the back page, that actually has the school children listed that were proposed. So the former project had somewhere between 22 and 29 uh, school children. Um, because this is a 55 and older community, this one is not uh, will not have any school children related to it. With the alternative B, which is the conventional layout using the R15 zoning, it was approximately 26 school children. With the cluster, you got about 30 school children. And then with the R5 layout, you know, using the smaller zoning district, you got about 58 school children. So ultimately, the proposed, the project that you see before you has least impact on school children, which is still something we're hearing uh, currently in some of the uh, public comments. Um, the other thing that I just want to point out is in terms of the um, in terms of the traffic. As you can see, there is a section for the traffic, and the preferred pro preferred project or the project that's in front of you. And we call it preferred project is just because that's what it's determined under seeker is the uh, 19 um, a.m. peak cars per hour and 25 uh, peak uh, p.m. trips uh, per on the peak p.m. hour. And what you'll see is under alternative A, B, C, D, they all have higher um, uh, peak uh, traffic. And that's because you have people leaving that certain times a little bit more regularly when you have 
your single family developments, as well as if when you have slightly denser uh, developments um, and you're dealing with a certain age range where when you're dealing with a senior population and that you typically have, you don't, it's not necessarily that you're not having people leave in the morning, but you're not having as many people leaving at the same exact hour, which we call, which they call the peak hour. So in terms of traffic, the 55 and older development actually has the least amount of traffic associated with it. And this is something that was reviewed by the town's own traffic consultant. That's correct. Staff. We had a third party uh, traffic consultant come in and review it. They were it was Kimberly Horn, and they reviewed it and had, went back and forth with the applicant uh, a number of times on the the traffic impacts. So I just wanted to also just kind of go quickly go through. I provided you the actual layouts. The first layout is the alternative A, which was like the, technically the original project that came before the town. And so, as you can see, that's, that's where a lot of concern came from in terms of that layout. If you go to the second, alternative B shows the conventional layout using the R15 zoning. So ultimately the this is what like more or less you could have in on that property. I mean, that's not to say that once you would dig down into the details, whether would you lose like a lot or two, that's potential. But generally that this is, gives you the general concept of what a traditional subdivision would be. And then the um, alternative C is your conventional, is your clustered development. So um, and how that would probably be most likely laid out or potentially could be laid out on that site. And then the last one is the R50, uh, I mean, excuse me, R5 um, zoning district, which would be the 5,000 square foot lots. So I hope this helps a little bit in terms of, you know, just understanding the different comparisons that were made and ultimately some of the um, decisions that the planning board felt uh, they could continuously could to could continue moving through the seeker process in terms of the environmental impacts. Um, a couple other things I just wanted to point out is that this process, while if if the zone were to be uh, if the zoning petition were to be approved, this project would still have to go back to the planning board for site plan approval. So which that means is there would still be additional review from the planning board looking at, you know, finalizing the layouts, finalizing, you know, any sort of traffic mitigations, um, also finalizing the architecture, the engineering, the stormwater utilities, all that stuff would be finalized. And, and we'd also take a look at if there's any other potential environmental impacts that would need to be mitigated for in terms of like once we start dealing with the actual details of the site. So this this project is not um, complete once the if the zoning petition were to be adopted, it still has to finish doing its review process and then ultimately would have to apply for a building permit. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Christy. Well, just to piggyback off of the discussion about the, the land use approvals, um, it is likely that this project is going to require certain area variances from the zoning board. I know there was some concern from the public about that, and I just wanted to kind of explain a little bit why that is a unique situation, um, because the applicant is applying an existing zone. So as Valerie mentioned earlier, initially they were proposing a new zone. So if a, if an applicant was proposing a new zone, they would tailor that zone to what they're proposing so that they don't need area variances. Here we have an existing multifamily zone in the town that has been applied to other um, large properties um, uniquely situated in the town. And so the applicant, instead of trying to create a new zone, which created the challenges Valerie also mentioned about then having to analyze what the potential impacts could be of applying that zone to any of those additional properties. Now we have an existing zone that's already gone through that environmental review. And now the applicant is trying as, as best they can, presumably, to conform that project to the existing zoning. So I think preferably from a legal standpoint, this is a better way of handling it than creating a new zone. Um, but it does create a situation where um, there is there could still be a need for variances, area variances, which is the case here. So 
So in addition to having to go to the planning board, um, they will likely also have to go to the zoning board, which has their own statutory criteria for area variances that they would have to consider as well with a public hearing, um, just as we do for any land use applications. Right. And right now, the the zoning variances that are potentially anticipated would need it would be in connection with the minimum distance between the principal buildings. So they're looking for a slightly uh, smaller distance. Um, also, in uh, connection with the children's play area, I believe they're going to ask for a variance from that. And then also for one building would have seven units instead of six units. So those are the three area variances that would, they would be seeing. And in terms of the, just a couple of, unless any, if uh, please interrupt us or ask any questions if you have them. Um, we just had the items kind of memorializing what we had already discussed um, in terms of the memo we submitted, as well as, you know, memorializing what the planning board's findings were. Um, so, but I'll, I'll just go through what I have left. But if you have anything before then, please feel free to stop me. So in terms of the zoning petition, um, once the project was changed, the seeker review was based upon what the project was, as Valerie described it, the 95 townhomes age restricted. Um, once the finding statement was adopted by the planning board, that was when the applicant, who was actually the owner of the property, submitted the zoning petition. But it's all based upon the same project. So it's it's all been a linear evolution uh, from what happened during the secret process to what you're reviewing now. So that is what the board is considering. You're considering the exact project that was reviewed during during the planning board review process for for a few years, um, and so I know what that one of the concerns that has come up is, so what happens if this project doesn't go forward after the zoning is put in place, and we, that, that's a very valid concern, and if the board were inclined to put that zoning in place, you would have to do so by a local law, and you have complete discretion in how you draft that local law, so. So there are a couple of op options, but what I would recommend is that the the local law, as we always do, even when you do it with solar or battery energy storage, we always do the local law as being specific to the property and to the project. So if that project doesn't go forward, then the, the zoning doesn't go forward. You can't rely upon that zoning, but we can go in even a step further in saying that the zoning only applies to this project, but we won't remap the property. So for rezoning, you actually remap the zoning map. We can make that contingent upon, say, getting a certificate of occupancy. So at that point, we will know that the, the so the zoning will be in place for the project, but the entire development would have to be completed in accordance with what's been reviewed and what's been analyzed before it could actually be applied to the property. And so no one else could just come in and try to say, well, the zoning is on this property, so I can now propose a much different multifamily development. And I think this is important legally because this is how it should be, because this is what the secret review was based upon. This is what your review is based upon. So if that is what this board is inclined to do, then legally you could not just approve the zoning unless it is related to this project. So really, I think this is a belt and suspenders and a very safe thing for, for the board to consider doing. And I would be happy to draft some, some legislation if, if you wanted to consider it. Um, but I think that's the appropriate way to move forward if you're inclined to do so. Um, so that's, does anyone have any questions with respect to that, with respect to the so zoning? Guaranteeing that should the project for whatever reason um, not continue that it would maintain its Art. residential zoning. Correct. It's single Until family it residential. It's a whole another secret process with another Correct. project. Correct. And Be then come back to the town board. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So there's no possible way that if we zone for this project that it can apply to anything else. That would be, that would be the absolute intention and that would be the way it was drafted. Yes. Okay. And, and legally that, like I said, that is how it should be because that's what the review up to this point has been. It's been site specific, it's been project specific. And so, and I'll get into some of the other items related to this, to this project, but you know, we talked about consist where there's consistency with the comprehensive plan, there's spot zoning, there's age restrictions. There's a lot of issues that are specific to this project 
that if the board were comfortable moving forward would still be specific to this project. So, you know, someone else shouldn't just be able to piggyback off of all of the seeker review that the planning board did, as well as the zoning analysis that the planning board did, as well as this board, in order to say that we have the zoning on this property. The zoning on this property should be for this project, for, should be for the project that was reviewed, and that is it. And that is the way that any local law would be drafted. Okay, good. Okay, so age restrictions. So one of one of the positives of this project, I think, um, and I don't mean to speak for the board, but one of the concerns that was raised earlier on was um, was the impact on the school district. So having this being um, an age restricted, fifty five or older development um, reduces the potential for school district for people um, going into the school district for children going into the school district. And Valerie went through with you um, how having a project of this type would significantly reduce the amount of potential school children as opposed to a excuse me, a single family residential development that would be permitted um, in the R15 district. So there are a couple of ways that we like to restrict those types of projects. Um, this is something that was offered by the applicant. Um, and there is the Housing for Older Persons Act, which is part of the Fair Housing Amendments Act. So this is all federal law, and that it requires that there's that there be um, eighty percent of the households have at least one person that's fifty five or older. But under the law, you can actually go further than that if you want to, and as part of the local law, make it a hundred percent of of residents be fifty five or older. Um, and that would even further reduce the potential for school for school children. Um, we would also, what we do generally um, for projects like this, um, really for any project that goes through site plan approval at the planning board, is we'll, we'll ask the applicant, and generally they're amenable to this, to put declarations on the project. So they can make a dec, we do declarations for stormwater management, um, sometimes for landscaping, it's appropriate, um, certainly for affordable housing, um, because as part as an element of this project, there is a 10 percent affordable housing um, where they have to make they have to uh, the, they ha the units have to be sold at a certain rate that's set by by the code. So those would be declarations that would be recorded against the property. So anyone who does a title search um, is going to see that those are done. And we could certainly also require, and actually HOPA, the Housing for Older Persons Act, requires it as well, that there be a recorded declaration against the property. So we could do that, and we could require that be part of the property. So anyone who's trying to buy into the property, anyone who's trying to get title insurance, anyone who's trying to get a mortgage, those entities are going to see what the restrictions are and are going to want confirmation that the people purchasing it can comply with those requirements. Otherwise, it could affect, you know, the lender or the insurer. So that's another way to try to um, ensure. I know there was some concern about how do we ensure that these mechanisms are going to be enforced. Um, also, with the affordable housing, you know, we've been talking somewhat over the years about um, how the town is going to stay on top of um, making sure that the affordable housing units are being rented in compliance with the code. Um, this is something that that should be involved in that conversation, um, if not for necessarily for this project, but, you know, for for all developments to make sure that um, when projects have certain restrictions on them, that we have mechanisms in place. And like I said, we've been talking about that. There are a lot of great resources in the area. We talked about working with IFCA. Um, and so this may be something to talk to them about as well. To, because there's there's management that they can do and, and that's done regularly, whether it's at the town level or through a third party contractor to make sure that um, we're staying on top of making sure um, that they're for the affordable housing, there are the number that, that they're providing their income limits every few years to, to ensure that they're at the limits that they should be living there. Um, and with the um, age restricted that they're of the ages that they're when they're on record as owning the property that they um, should be living there as well. We also in a community like this, um, you know, generally people are moving there because they want a certain lifestyle. So if you have someone who moves in 
by happenstance, and I don't anticipate this would happen with three kids, I imagine the the other neighboring property owners are not going to be too happy about that. So there is also a self-policing mechanism to this that can work for a community of this of this magnitude. So it, they, there are ways, if the board is so inclined, to try to enforce that or find ways to make sure that they are enforced um, at the starting point. Can it be deed restricted that nobody under 19 lives there? Under 19? Not, I believe. Yeah, yeah, it's under 55. No, no, nobody under 19 lives there. Somebody has to be over 55, yes, but nobody under 19 can be there. Well, yes. I live there more than three months. So, so the, de <clears throat> the declaration in the seeker um, documents that the, and this is the applicant putting forth, um, it said how um, it said the declaration be recorded against the property so that potential existing and subsequent property owners are aware of the age restrictions. However, individuals 19 or older residing with their spouse who must satisfy the minimum age, a surviving spouse who is 19 or older who is who resided in a unit prior to the death of their spouse, provided that the deceased spouse was a minimum age at the time of death and or a child or family member who is 19 or older residing with a parent family member who is of minimum age or who otherwise falls into one of the class of persons accepted may reside within the unit. Meanwhile, no person under the age of 19 shall occupy a unit for more than 120 days per year. Okay. Any other questions on that? Or we can always come back to it. Um, there were just a couple of more items I was going oh, go I was oh, going to check off. But no, if there was something you wanted to talk yeah, about, yes, nineteen. Okay. okay. Sorry. Continue. So one of the other things um, is I, I know there's been some talk about spot zoning, and I know that's a that's a scary term, and I get it. Um, so. The issue is that this is a unique property um, in that it has a historical commercial use in that it was a psychiatric hospital and it's substantially larger than all of the other parcels around it. And while, and so by making it residential, it is actually bringing it into greater conformity to what it's historically been. Um, and the reality is, you know, the feedback that we've received both from the state and from the county is that we're being told there's a need to create more housing. Um, the state is is creating a lot of initiatives um, where they're going, they're trying, you know, grant funding and whatnot could be contingent upon um, creating a certain amount of housing. That's been a, a topic of discussion for several years. Um, the county's comments, the county planning board's comments on also stated that the concept of redeveloping the former hospital site with new multifamily housing is generally consistent with the county planning board's long range planning policies. And in fact, um, the county stated that one of the, their concerns was the stark economic age and racial disparity between unincorporated Ossining and the village of Ossining and the county actually objected to the age restriction um, on the units, which because they were trying to make it more accessible to anyone. But obviously, as we've discussed, based upon the concerns that were raised regarding um, school children and traffic, making it age restricted um, is something that's very important, a very important aspect of this project in terms of what's being considered by the board at this time and that was considered by the planning board um it's part of the secret process so that that doesn't really seem to be an item but the the county the, that was the county's comments was this is consistent with what we're looking for and um you know some of the aspects that that are being proposed that make it a little bit more restrictive are the things that the county has objected to um and Valerie, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the comp plan. Um, I just want to make a quick comment because um, I reviewed the letter by the county and um, while they did not support the age restriction, I think 
the other point that they were trying to make is that there is a huge disparity between, um, I think, uh, you know, not just by there, they don't, they don't, they don't promote a age disparity between um, people that live in the town and people in the village, but they also mark that there's a stark economic and racial disparity between the unincorporated Ossining and the village of Ossining. So I think that, um, I don't think the county supported the, um, I guess you want to say that the, the this property is, uh, would you, you would consider not accessible to all peoples because of the price point. I guess that's what I'm thinking. Right. And I think um, just to respond to that, um, if you recall, this is something that the town board was very concerned with. And so the applicant during the seeker process, um, and this was part of the comments that the this town board uh, submitted to the applicant during the uh, like comments on the draft environmental impact statement. And so as part of that, the applicant actually uh, reduced some of the size of the units so that there will be a mix in terms of the uh, costs for the units. And then you also have 10% uh, affordable housing too, which would also further bring in some of that economic um, viability, I mean, variability within the project. Right. So I'm glad you just commented on that because that's, I think, an important thing to know. Right. Mm -hmm. Do we know how many middle and how many low uh, units there will be? Um, well, there's, well, for sure, we have the 10% affordable units, so that's nine there. And then I believe there's, um, I have to take a, uh, let me see if I have it. Um, I believe there's about 30 something units that's are like in staffers. Um, and I believe those will have different price points than the larger town homes. W1 Oh, thank you. Yes. So there are, yep, yeah, I said so there's 20 stacker units. Um, so those will have a slightly different price point. Then there's 41 townhouse units um, that are two bedrooms, 15 that are three bedrooms. Um, and then there's other townhouse units that are slightly larger that are, and there's 10 of those, there are three bedrooms, and then there's uh, 10 affordable units. So you have uh, a number of different varying price points. I just wanted to add to that too, since I, I was on the page. When they do the secret about, do they um, see what, if it was single lots, what those prices would have been? Uh, no, because that, that would be, no, because that typically would be the next like step in terms of analysis. But my guess is based on if you're dealing with 15,000 square foot lots and in some of the other prices, that would probably be in the higher end of the townhomes that they're proposing. Thanks. And then the last item I just wanted to raise because I know it came up um, during the public hearings is that um, it, the, the town doesn't own this property. So this this is private property. This is, the, the it, it has been vacant for some time as Valerie mentioned since it stopped being used um, as a psychiatric hospital, but it is private property. The town has no no authority or ability to purchase it to, or, or financing to purchase it um, to, to run it, to turn it into something else. So, um, you know, it, it, it is what it is now, but that doesn't mean that the, the, and the town is reviewing the project, but that doesn't mean that the town has the authority to just take it over and make it into something that it's not because it's private property and the, the property owner is entitled to sell it um, for whatever purpose gets approved. So I just want to remind everyone of that. Yeah, we have been asked why we didn't turn it into a park and a we couldn't afford it. Um and B it's not an <laughs> we can't afford it. Yeah, it's not it's not for sale it's fine. And and turning an abandoned uh mental institution into a park isn't always recommended. But anyway, um okay. So I mean Valerie and I are happy to answer any specific questions about um, you know any issues we talked about, any issues we haven't talked about, um, or, you know. If, I mean, if, I have a question. I know when um, 
when I was looking at it and it was way too big um, in its original iteration of 188 units and it was way too tall. Um, we've crowned our village. Um, I was looking at the zoning in the S50 zone and I thought that was eight acre lots. 5,000 square feet, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so the that's that's for the village, um, right? The um, village area yeah. that it's it it wraps around the you know like it's like half yes. R fifteen, yeah, or like I don't know, yes, quarter the, R fifteen and right. two thirds. The village does not have half acre lots in its setting, so they're eighth acre. Yes. Okay, so and the project's eighteen acres, right? That's correct. Uh, seventeen point eight acres, so round enough to eight. All right, so if it was perfectly flat, then it would hold 144 units. So in the... So I'm just wondering where you got the number that you did for the comparable. So Because when I was thinking about it... So, um, the, uh, so the applicant actually, um, if you turn to that last conventional alternative D, right. that's where the planning board had the applicant... Um, do basically as if it was taking the uh, village zoning and applying it to that site, and they got about sixty-seven lots. Right. Out of that. So I'm wondering how my math gives me one hundred and forty-four. Um, well, you also have to include. Uh, that's because you probably did a straight calculation. Yeah. So you also have to include roadways and other uh, different site development elements that always reduces the total amount of units you could potentially get on a site. Okay. So if you look at that layout, you can see that there are some areas that they're not, they weren't proposing to put additional lots on. Okay. And they were avoiding all the steep slopes. And right. The, they were right. You know, in this particular, and the in this and particular the... layout. Okay. Now it's not, this is just a conceptual. So, you know, when, if, if we were to like, if this, if any sort of, um, project were to start actually doing like a site plan on this, there would potentially be some additional adjustments, but this just kind of gives you a general sense of how many units could, I mean, how many lots could be developed. If it were zoned as the village has it. Villages, yes. Okay. Um, okay, because that's how. So when you're, so the, so that was about that's about 67 lots and then what they're proposing are 96 units so it's just about a 30 unit difference okay well it's less than 144 but they wouldn't have fit anyway um all right one concern i have um this so it's deed restricted that nobody under 19 can be there um my only concern, one of my concerns is the design for the senior living, um, these townhomes have a lot of steps. So that's one of my concerns, but my understanding is most of them can have elevators. Um, do we know if all of them have a space for elevators or just like do the stackables have a space for elevators? I think some of the stackables are going to be at like uh entry level and then okay so they are one level you know some, some will be and then the, you know others will not be and that's some of the stuff that we're going to be the planning board would be looking into with the next round because it also requires arb approval so all those details would be worked out during site plan approval okay so during the site plan and the architectural review right. board and they'll discuss you know making it truly accessible for seniors right and this is something that you know we can always bring back to the planning board to say it's of a concern from the town board that it's as accessible as possible um but also the elevator is not doesn't come with the units that's like an add-on right it would be an add-on but it would be built so that the elevator could be installed right yes but I'm saying like that's an additional expense that a purchaser would have to decide if they can afford another another that's so put in the elevator. Right. If they want doesn't it. come with the elevator. Right. Right. Also, can I have a quick question? No, no, it's time for questions. It's time for questions. Um, so in all the alternatives, uh, I see, you know, you included how many proposed residents. 
So in this proposed project, um, am I correct in calculating it could be 190 residents, assuming there's two people in each? Yes, one? I mean, that's correct. I mean, usually that would be on order of how many? Approxima yeah, yes, approximately. That's correct. Okay. Can we go to the back side of the chart? Sure. And, and um, I know this isn't necessarily kind of your area, but um, the fiscal piece. Yes. I was hoping maybe we can march through. I think that was maybe on the board during the last project. I think that was an important thing we looked at is what what's the tax revenue? What's this going to cost the school? All that. So Sure. I mean, I can run through the calculations. Now, ultimately, uh, I will say with any sort of fiscal analysis that's run, it's ultimately, you know, the final say is the assessor, right? So these are just uh, estimates. But typically, when you run a fiscal analysis in terms of seeker, you run the same, like more or less the same uh, method methodology for all the alternatives. So you can just generally see an overall comparison. But in terms of the overall taxes, you know, the highest taxes that would be brought in would be from like the conventional layout R5. This, I mean, this is the one with the, the village of Austin and zoning applied to it. And that was predicted at $36.9 million uh, in tax revenue. But also keep in mind that this would also contribute close to 60 school children. So there would probably ultimately be um, not necessarily a net uh, benefit to those particular taxes. Um, we would have to, we could do like, theoretically we could um, do like a fiscal, like you can do an additional fiscal impact in terms of the overall school taxes generated, but this was just to give a general sense to the planning board of how many taxes would be coming in. But in the second most uh, taxes that would be collected would be the seniors. And this one would be uh, ones where you wouldn't necessarily have to deduct from the, for the school taxes because the school taxes would be like a net benefit to the schools because there would be no school children associated with it. This was also addressed in the finding statement, if you want me to address. Sure. I can, yeah, I I can read that. So this is from the finding statement that was adopted by the planning board um, <clears throat> on page 21, fiscal impacts. Taxes collected for municipal demands include townwide unincorporated town, ambulance district, refuse lights, fire, townwide water district, Austin school and library taxes. Currently, the project site generates a total of $75,628 for these services based on the analysis contained in Chapter 3J fiscal, fiscal impacts of the SDEIS, which is Supplemental Draft Environmental Impact Statement. The proposed project is not anticipated to have significant impacts on community facilities or require significant capital investments by the public service providers. Further, the pro proposed project is age restricted. There are no anticipated impacts to the school district. The proposed project would result in net positive fiscal impact for all taxing jurisdictions. The SDEIS estimated that the total annual net fiscal impact of the proposed project is $875,722 compared to existing conditions, the proposed project would result in a total increase of approximately $800,904 in annual net surplus revenue. So we're, these are annual numbers. On the cost side, the proposed project is not expected, anticipated to have significant impacts on community facilities or require significant capital investments by the public service providers. Further, because the project is age restricted, there is no anticipated impacts to the school district. The proposed project would not impact the school district other than paying an additional approximately $691,151 in school taxes in excess of the approximately $49,568 paid by the existing site. So you're looking at a, a net benefit to the schools of about um, six hundred and forty thousand dollars a year, and a net benefit overall of about eight hundred thousand dollars a year. Okay, and currently as it is, it pays. What does it pay now? Seventy-five thousand. Um, 
Am I correct? Did the are they proposing to do um a loop in our sewer system as well? Yes, the uh the sewer system would be looped. Absolutely. Okay, so that's a benefit to the community. Even I know the water department likes to have that to keep our system running. That's correct, and that is something that they that's they, that's something they ask for for yes. every developer. Yes. Okay. Oh, all right. Any questions? Uh, I just have one on the price point again. If, uh, I don't know. Remember how you were talking about deed restrictions and all that, Christy? Mm -hmm. Is there anything that the board can implement or is there a state that the spread between the, the affordable and the, the other units, say? Is there a certain percentage that has to stay within or it can be as high and different as... I mean, I think I think it's based upon the market and, you know, we don't want the units to be vacant either if that's what, what ends up getting constructed. Um, I think that the board did convey um, last year the concerns about the price points. And so that was why some of the designs were altered. Um, we can make that suggestion if the board is inclined um, to approve this to the applicant. But I mean, I, I don't know that we could we could mandate that. Um, other than what we're allowed to do based upon the code in terms of the affordable units. Thank you. Matt? Um, just a comment. Uh, my wife and I have been here, this is our fifth decade living on Minkle Road, and the there, there were changes that happened in the community, even without Ribbonol. There's more traffic, there was more school kids in the neighborhood than there have ever been before. And I'm very sensitive to the way the neighborhoods changed. But the reality is we didn't do anything to make a change. It was the communities around us that forced the change on us. The the 18 wheel wheel tractor trailers that come down 134, they weren't there 15 or 20 years ago. And the traffic that backs up at 9A and 134, it used to take me one or two lights to get off 134 onto 9A. Now it takes me four or five. And I'm very sensitive to hearing my neighbors, our neighbors, tell us that there was a time where it was one horse per half acre. And I'm sensitive to that. I, I'm not making fun in, in the least. But the reality is it was never going to stay that way. We could shut our doors and, and hope that if we don't go out, nothing will change tomorrow. But we come out of our homes and everything's changed and it's going to keep changing. I think the reality is that the board has to seek um, more diversified sources of tax revenue. I think this is an opportunity to do that. We can't say that we want only single family homes built because we don't build the homes. We have to hope that a developer will come along one day. And this developer has been at this for what, a decade? I haven't been here that long, but that's my understanding. So if we have an opportunity for the community to grow, it makes a lot of sense to me. And if we are faced with the change that means there'll be more of us here, we can't control that because the communities around us aren't competing with us. When 9A is upgraded by New York State, it'll draw traffic through Austin, not to Austin, but it'll be more crowded on the roadways. The schools are expanding. They have to build new buildings. By shutting down the development of a home or a community such as Rivenol, we won't stop this. You call it progress, you call it change, you call it modern times. The label is less important. The reality is if this particular project won't impact the changes that we're facing, it has a lot of benefits to this. And I think that's an important consideration. Building on that, um, the state's actually not happy with us right now that we haven't had any uh, significant building in three years. So we're at zero percent for the last three years. So our grant funding is, um, and some of the other funding, state funding is at risk for us. Um, we, have a we don't know what's happening with GE yet. So, you know, that could help. But um, as it stands by the end of the year, we won't be eligible for certain uh, funding grant streams. Yes. Um, I'm just curious because we had Parthenol built 
that was over three years ago. Yeah. Can you was, believe it? It was uh the I already checked. Yeah, really. When you say it was over three years ago, like completed over yeah. three years ago, or it was yeah, yeah. Uh, we're getting over. <laughs> I <I'm> because <laughs> it doesn't seem like over three years ago, but um you know, to me that was uh yeah, I mean okay. No, it was and that and that kept us in good graces that gave us three percent. I've been watching the numbers because the state's pushing. Um right. so So that's good. You know, one of the things I like about the project is it's repurposing an already developed area with, you know, decaying buildings. Um, I still think it's dense. Um, I mean, I know it kind of is a, a midway point between the the town zoning of Half Acre on one side and the and the very dense zoning on the of the village on the other side and it's kind of like a middle you know the size houses of the town with the with the with the space constraints of the village so it's kind of a middle ground between them um still pretty dense so it's got that and it's not taking down a forest um you know i think we should really preserve all of our green spaces if possible anything we have remaining and i know we're going to be working on the zoning for that um very soon. All right, I don't know where I'm going with that. So, uh, anything? No, that was very helpful. Thank you. I mean, just the one last thing: uh, the 55 and older. Mm -hmm. Can that ever be changed throughout the life of, say, five years down the road? No, it's going to be in there. It'll be in the local law if that's the direction the board is inclined to go. And it'll be a, it'll be recorded against the entire property. So basically, everyone there would have to get together and say we want to, to you know remove this, and then they would have to go to the town and get the town to sign off on it. It's it's a virtual impossibility. Right, and I would say, in there ha there are some communities not in not even in Westchester, but like outside in other areas of the United States that you know developed a lot of 55 and older right communities and there's always that concern that you know once a certain generation passes that you know will you have the demand and in the younger generation but in terms of 55 and older communities especially in the town of Austin or the village of Austin or even in the immediate area there's really not a lot of those types of communities so you know, to worry about whether there's like an overdevelopment of those particular types of products. I don't foresee that, you know, especially in this particular area. Okay. All right. Um, I don't think I have any more questions or comments, anything? Okay. I thank you so much for taking the time thank you. to come and talk to us. Um, we'll have a we'll and then talk you know, and all the all the documents that we were referring to tonight are available online. Those are just letting you know for the public to know as well. And so, so everything that we've talked about tonight are from directly from documents that as part of the secret process. Okay, great. And that's all available. That's all available to the, the public planning board web, yep. web page. Okay, on the planning board web page. If you yes. go to pending applications, you go to River Knoll, and then all the secret okay. documents are just listed. Yeah. So pending applications, River Knoll, everything's there for anybody. I just say thank you because this is a very helpful document. Um, is this available to the public as well? Yeah, so that information that you have is directly taken from the supplemental draft environmental impact statement, which is available online, and that's under the alternative section. What I can also do is tomorrow morning, I could scan this condensed this version condensed in version. to Sandy um, so that the public doesn't have to try to filter through for everything. Yeah. I think that was what you were getting at. <laughs> and, and what I can do, what I also can do is I can put some labels on the, you know, just so the public sees. Not a problem. Thank you again. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, that concludes our town board work session. Um, please join us next week for our legislative session. And thank you and good night.
Oh, I make a motion to vote. But, oh, and we'd like to go into motion. executive session for advice of council. Do you have personnel? And advice personnel. Of personnel, and I think a contract too. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming.